Hello and uh, welcome back to this presentation on raising students. In the last part of the presentation, we have already seen uh, some aspects of this material as an introduction, uh, the basic understanding of what this material is. I mean, where, uh, what category to do, uh, do this steel uh, belongs to in terms of high strength or low strength or medium strength. And then the classification of steels, where exactly this, this steel sits in the whole steel company. The conceptual uh, understanding of it as in the underlying concept, and even the name of the material uh, that uh, indicates the processes involved in the making of this steel or the uh, strength of the mechanism that is involved for the steel. And the different grades from the commercial standpoint, the advantages and application is first that this material was able to buy of the different industries that it is able to serve. And then the heat treatment, which is a crucial aspect, as the material gains its strength uh, through the aging treatment that uh, we discussed. The solution treatment also for the homogenization uh, purposes. But the main aging treatment is what gives this material the strength, the high strength, that it is very famous for the high strength and toughness that it is famous for. So we had to look at the treatment, or we'll start with mechanical properties. So that's where uh, we ended the solution treatment and the aging treatment. Air cooling is sufficient. Uh, I mean, do not have this desired transformation as well. Air cooling is a sufficient mode of uh, cooling as opposed to water quenching or uh, oil quenching. Air cooling is a sufficient and has been proved to be satisfactory. And uh, even the relatively slow cooling rates are also uh, not harmful as in they don't lead to undesired transformations. And the osaging for some uh, specific Purposes being the dimension severity, that's another feature, a useful feature that has been utilized uh, to take this advantage of having done finalized, having finalized dimensions before aging itself. That was able to, it, it was harnessed to some applications uh, that they were able to get some, uh, that they were able to. Get the material to final dimensions and even weld it before sending it to the final aging treatment. And then uh, it was sent for uh, final, uh, it was sent in service. So that is also another thing that uh, has been a key feature of this material that it is not able, doesn't distort much because of the low point expansion. So that's uh, a brief uh, discussion of what. Uh, we saw. Let's we'll start with mechanical uh, manufacturing processes. So generally, this is produced by vacuum printing or double vacuum printing. But double vacuum printing is generally preferred. Uh, double vacuum printing and refining machine. Uh, double vacuum in the sense it is melted by uh, vacuum induction held. Pin is what is called followed by bar with VAR uh, that is vacuum arc pre melt. And that's what we design melting. The first uh, process is vacuum induction melt, and then the rebuild through VAR process, vacuum arc rebuild. So this is what is generally done, uh, double vacuum melting. Uh, of course, the different regulations and the precautions that are taken to not have this uh, impurity gases uh, inside the material uh, or the ingots. Uh, the different uh, blocks of material that are uh, formed as electrodes or uh, solid components uh, in any shape or form. Those are taken care of. We do not have these harmful gases flown in uh, to the chamber. But those are all uh, followed. These are general precautions uh, followed for vacuum bending of any uh, material. As uh, for the hot working and cold working in this material, uh, it is both hot work and cold work, readily hot work, 
as mentioned, and uh, conventional rolling and forcing operations which are done to bring down the material to its uh, dimensions as per the process plans. Uh, hot working is done. The, proce the processes which have the principal processes involved are forging, hot forming, and extrusion. In terms of hot forming, uh, it is mostly bending, hot spinning, hot drawing. These are the general uh, processes we perform from the data books that we have and in the states. Uh, these are the common hot forming processes. So, uh, for the cold work also, uh, you have hot work or solution and yield aging skills, readily cold work up to the 85% uh, of reduction. A significant number, meaning it is we are able to reduce it code or to code working to about 85%. So, as mentioned in the earlier presentation, that it has good workability. That's a, a, a statistic that supports the claim that we are able to uh, hold work in up to about 85% reduction. Significant number. Uh, low work hardening rate, as mentioned earlier, if that facilitates the production of sheet, strip, and wire. These are all uh, as per the application point of view. You need sheet, uh, the material in sheet form, strip, or wire form, maybe. So, no more cutting rate that this material is able to offer has been utilized and as it facilitates the production of all these uh, uh, different geometries. And uh, another thing is the extra low carbon martin site that we have that we've discussed that the martin site is not having much carbon because the carbon is very low. Uh, there is little interstitial material available to pin these locations with cold work. That's why it is able to work harder and less because there is not much interstitial material available which should pin these locations. So that, that's why it is able to be, uh, I mean, we are able to form it easily because of the set reason. Uh, cold load solution and yield material is preferred for forming and drawing applications, specifically for forming and drawing. We have this solution and yield, cold load solution and yield material. So once it is cold load uh, and solution and yield, you have uh, this, this is the preferred state for forming and drawing applications. Commonly go run through all these processes to spinning, shear forming, ink drawing, hydro forming as well. And then the heading of fasteners, bending and shearing as uh, as as uh, suitable for the application. Uh, you have cold work prior to aging can be used to increase strength after the aging. This is one aspect that before aging heat treatment, we are able to if you if you if you perform cold work before aging, this is helping or uh, this aids in uh, gaining more strength for the material. It imparts more strength. That's what uh, was observed. Cold work prior to aging can be used to increase strength after the aging. For example, a uh, case study where 90% cold reduction brought about hardness of 26 points of hardness. Uh, this is for the uh, below, uh, I mean, before mentioned point that. About 90% cold reduction when it was done. This is from specific from a case study. That after about 90% cold reduction, there was a hardness increase of only about six points HRC. So that indicates the uh, that the hardness increase is not much, the hardness increment is not much even after 90% of cold reduction. So that's one uh, note side point for the case study and uh, so th that is one another thing that uh, if you perform cold work cold working process before aging in treatment then this is able to impart more strength for material this this can be uh, controlled in terms of if the strength achieved is uh, is required to be high, really high, then this cold working parameters can be uh, we, we can work with the cold working parameters in terms of the 
temperature, the degree of deformation to be able to have this effect in terms of more or less strength. Uh, that's the point. Uh, ductility declines in the raised material about uh, about, about forty percent reduction of cold weather. So this is uh, this may be said as uh, a point to consider for toughness for maximizing toughness. If you want to maximize toughness, then uh, ensure that the reduction of cold water doesn't go beyond the person. That's how we can see this. That if you want more toughness in the material, may be required for some applications and critical applications, as mentioned earlier. Then uh, the limit to which you can cold work is about 40%. That's how we can see this. Because the ductility has been seen to decline after that point. As for mechanical properties, uh, two properties namely to note that the impact transition temperature, uh, there is retention of useful toughness at low temperatures even. So even at low temperatures, it was found that the useful toughness was retained. So this is helpful. I mean, this is uh, this is something a kind of a requirement you can say for many applications, for many uh, these demanding applications, which we mentioned. Strategic industries that the, the division was very low, then you have to have the retention of properties as a requirement for those applications. So that's one thing. And uh, energy absorption drop of decreasing temperature is small and gradual. So uh, even in the drop of energy absorption, when the temperature is decreasing, it is small and gradual. So this is something uh, beneficial from many uh, perspectives. Because even for the safety aspect, you have this small and gradual thing is uh, useful and needed even sometimes for those applications mentioned before. There's no upper transition in impact energy absorption. So even for the impact energy absorption, there's not much, there's no abrupt transition. And again, the same point applies. So but for the impact, in this case, high resistance to unstable fracture propagation. This was mentioned earlier as well. That uh, you don't want the fracture to propagate unstable because we need some time when the crack develops in the material. Uh, inspection schedules are so set that we need some time uh, to be able to, you know, I mean, there should be some time for the crack to develop so that the inspection schedules can detect and take actions accordingly. So if it is not having much resistance to unstable facts propagation, then uh, that translates to issues uh, and therefore it uh, affects the safety of the personnel involved around the component, whichever, whichever application this material is employed. Uh, one thing to note is the fracture toughness is influenced by all these factors, i.e. melting practice, it is influenced by the amount of reduction as well. But uh, as mentioned, the cold working uh, degree of cold working is also something that affects the toughness. Finishing temperature even the, in both the uh, hot working and cold working and other mill practices. So the, the melting practice as mentioned first uh, and the amount of reduction in finishing temperature, other mill practices, these are all factors that influence the fracture toughness. So if you want to uh, optimize the fracture toughness, if that's priority, then you have to consider all these factors. Meaning, the amount of care you take in all these practices will influence the amount, uh, the amount of toughness. Yeah, the toughness achieved is uh, uh, a result of the care you take in all these. Practices, melting practice, amount of reduction, finishing temperature, and some other mill practices. So the toughness achieved is influenced by all these factors. So that is something that uh, needs to be controlled in order to have this maximized toughness. Uh, and that's where you can have more uh, fracture toughness. So from the fracture toughness perspective, fracture mechanics, this is all uh, in the fracture mechanics perspective that we need to maximize the fracture toughness in order to have this uh, 
but a lot of this unstable fracture, fracture uh, that, that are generated in the mishaps that happen. Notch tensile properties, uh, there's a high ratio of notch tensile strength to tensile strength, even at low temperatures. So this is un unobtainable in conventional steels at same high strength levels. So uh, a noted emphasis here that uh, this is not, we are not able to obtain this in uh, uh, conventional steels. At the same high strength levels, they are not able to have this uh, uh, ratio of notch tensile strength to tensile strength. So it's high for many reasons. So that gives you, uh, uh, again, a unique factor to choose this material uh, when it comes to uh, you know, choosing between the different high strength steels that you have, the other high strength steels uh, in the same uh, similar strength level category. Uh, there is conflicting data for petty tests, and this is attributable to variations in procedures used for production of test results. For example, uh, the tests, the fatigue tests that were done, uh, it may be done after sheening of the samples, or it may be done after uh, fine polishing, maybe, or uh, so it depends on where you do the test, or where the test was done in the, in the papers, the research papers, and, and the different projects that have taken this material consideration. The point where you do the test, the test, and the variation in the procedure also, used for production of test specimens, they all affect, they all have an effect to influence the fatigue test data. So that's something that has uh, translated or uh, uh, taken the shape of this conflicting data in the fatigue tests. Uh, this material. Short clean vacuum refined material is recommended for fatigue tests. So this is a recommendation that after short cleaning of this vacuum refined material, uh, they were able to get uh, better results. And uh, that's why it has been recommended uh, for fatigue tests. And uh, one thing to note is that the precipitation hardening, uh, what it does for the properties that we have. Uh, the dispersed obstacles or basically the particulates that are formed in the uh, precipitation hardening process, they prevent dislocation moment using a second phase precipitation process. So if they prevent the dislocation moment, uh, it kind of strengthens the material. So that's what it does internally, the precipitation hardening. And therefore, the high strength, we can say. Uh, precipitate fraction, fraction and size affects the strength and hardness uh, in the material. So the fraction of the precipitates and the size of the precipitates have an effect on the strength and hardness, the resulting strength and hardness. So basically they are a function. The function of uh, the strength and hardness are a function of the precipitate fraction and size. That's uh, the way to see it. Uh, machining, the machining aspect, uh, because uh, after it is cold work or hot work, uh, you still need some more material to be removed, depending on the applications. So that machining aspect of the material has been also a topic of uh, research. It has spurred research because we need to machine this material uh, to be able to have this final product. You have to take out some material, of course, in the conventional uh, manufactured perspective, so you need to remove material in order to have this uh, value addition and uh, the, the geometry that you need for the application requires removal of material from the, uh, the raw material or the raw geometry that we have. This is most easily machined in the annual condition. And not uh, surprising because annual conditions are soft conditions, uh, basically 30 or 35 HRC hardness. So that makes it uh, amenable to machining. So that is one, one thing noted. Right? Arranged material machine, machining also feasible and uh, similar conventional hard machine procedures are employed. Uh, whatever uh, you have, uh, with the similar procedures that are used for conventional hard materials machining, 
these are also uh, applied to marriage material because once the material gets wet, you have to have more precautions in terms of the choice of cutting tools, the machining conditions also become important uh, for machining this marriage material. Basically, high strength it has gained its high strength comparably with the nail condition. Uh, Rigid equipment is needed, sharp tools are needed, and there's an abundance of coolant needed also. So these are all uh, things that you have to take into account uh, to be able to safely machine managed material. So that is also done. That is a point. It is also feasible. Has been there are a lot of research papers that have uh, researched the uh, machining of material managing steel in the managed condition, even in the hard condition as well. Uh, as uh, needed for some applications, high application because it's you need to have some tighter tolerances. So even in the managed material also, the condition also, uh, the machining is done. We have data. Turning, milling, drilling, tapping, reading. These are all the literature is there with established recommended practices. So even these uh, specifically what processes are done, we have See the third point. Temperature control is needed for machining or gauge between cutting fluid supplied to the cutting zone. I mean, you have to ensure that cutting fluid is supplied to the cutting zone. Because once the material is machined, you have more heat generated, especially in the various condition. So temperature control becomes essential. So that uh, is to be ensured. And uh, MQL, this is a sustainable practice, sustainable, I mean, I mean, the sustainable machining has become uh, a topic of, uh, uh, it is a trending topic, uh, both sustainable machining of uh, commercial material, additive manufacturing material also, because what sustainable machining uh, entails is, there should be, you should look into account, you should, you should take into account three aspects. That it is sustainable from the environmental point of view, it is sustainable from the economic point of view, it is sustainable from the societal point of view. Meaning, we should be having less impact on the environment. We should be having less impact on the societal perspective. The societal perspective. We should be having less impact from the economic perspective also. So, uh, less carbon emissions, less material wastage. These are all uh, keywords or uh, topics that we consider when we talk about sustainable uh, future, essentially, not just machining. Uh, and uh, speaking of which, we have kept uh, this is a top agenda, you know, global agenda that we have sustainable goals, sustainable development goals with SDGs. So, Coming from that uh, approach, sustainable machining is also a trending topic in the machining, the, the mechanical industries, especially the machining industries, wherein we are employing sustainable practices to have less impact on the environment in terms of less carbon emissions and uh, less impact to the operator in terms of not, not, not exposing the operator to harmful Coolants, for example, flood cooling is now avoided uh, to, to, to much to a greater extent, uh, and that's where uh, that from us takes us to MQL, minimum quantity lubricant, wherein you are supplying lubricant uh, in very small quantity. For example, maybe one fifty or ten to five hundred ml per hour. So this is the amount of coolant that is uh, supplied per hour compared to flood cooling, where you have Huge amount of coolant supplied to the cutting zone. This is wastage of coolant. It even harms the operator. And all the, uh, the machine power, the coolant supply, uh, you know, the coolant that has to be supplied also uh, takes up uh, energy. Storage of coolant, the transport of coolant. So all these are aspects that we can avoid if we use minimum quantity of coolant. And that's what the concept of MQL is about. Then you have a small amount of cooling or lubricating agents to the cutting zone in the form of aerosol. 
and the lubricating flow rates are very low as mentioned 10 to 500 ml per hour per soft and the savings are in terms of cutting fluid the energy the cost so these are all aspects beneficial aspects coming out of minimum quantity lubrication i.e sustainable machining practice so those uh, in fuel based methods machining methods are also found feasible for this material with low feed rates uh, there's a there's a specific paper that talks about how uh, how uh, they were able to concurrently, uh, I'm sorry, how they were able to optimize residual stresses uh, by ensuring that this uh, feed rates, low feed rate along with NQL. So they did machining with NQL and uh, with low feed rates, they were able to have this optimum residual stresses. So they were able to harness or uh, what do you call it? They were able to optimize this residual stress uh, which was needed, compressive residual stresses are needed for some applications. So they were able to impart those residual stresses through fuel machining with low feed rates. Higher feed rates, they were able to, they were getting, uh, they were not getting good results, desired results in terms of not getting optimal residual stresses, for example. So even those papers have spoke uh, about the feasibility of fuel based machine methods in the raging state. And uh, so the surface roughness, uh, I mean, not only does it improve the surface roughness and residual stresses, uh, that is the point. And surface roughness, besides aesthetic appeal, because of course it is aesthetically appealing, uh, a higher surface roughness, I'm sorry, a lower surface roughness, uh, is appealing. Aesthetically, it is required in many applications. Use a lot of products that have good surface roughness. Uh, but it also affects the fibrological properties that is affected. Uh, fatigue strength, corrosion resistance, these are all function of the surface surface achieved uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the product. So those are to be uh, ensured. Surface surface is also required to be low from these standpoints. Fibrological standpoint, fatigue strength standpoint, corrosion resistance standpoint also. So that's uh, thinking about uh, NQL and the surface of this residual stresses. Uh, regarding the grind for grinding purposes, heavy duty water soluble fluid is to be used because uh, it may, I mean, if, if you don't use heavy duty water soluble fluid and use some medium duty or low uh, duty, light duty, sorry, uh, fluids. For grinding, then this will have an impact on the wheel wear. There will be more wheel wear, wear and tear, as in. So that is something that was suggested in the papers and the data books, the material and technical books, that heavy duty water soluble fluid be used when grinding this particular material. Blasting or pickling for oxide removal is done, especially after hot water or other thermal treatments. So, and the degree of uh, the temperature, the time durations depend on the amount of oxide that you have to remove. So, the more the oxide form, the more the temperature, the time is needed for the plastic and pigment. Uh, and salt bath picking processes that operate above 320 degrees centigrade should not be used because they modify the properties. So, to avoid modification of properties, it is advised that salt bath picking processes be restricted to 320 uh, and not be used after the said temperature. So nitriding, this is, uh, we know that uh, nitriding is a surface chemistry modification process where you are trying to modify the surface chemistry of the material to nitrogen diffusion. So the nitride, the nitrogen will diffuse on the surface of the material and form nitrides, and this is uh, particularly useful for iron based uh, materials, iron alloys, uh, wherein the, we are able to uh, improve wear and fitting properties specifically. Uh, so, the surface hardness is what uh, changes because of the nitrides form, uh, and that's where we are able to 
perform uh, well in wear, fatigue, etc. Gas and plasma nitride obligation is predominantly found in the literature. There are a lot of papers that have discussed successful application of gas and plasma nitriding for the raising species. And there is a feasibility of simultaneous nitriding in aging around 430 to 480 with a shallow but hard case. Meaning, uh, because the aging treatment also uh, entails some temperatures around the nitriding temperature, they, uh, the researchers have tried to simultaneously nitride and age. Uh, okay, what if we did uh, nitride and age simultaneously? And this was found to be possible, feasible uh, around that temperature, but the case was found to be shallow, but it was hard. Uh, that, that, was a, uh, that was what was noted. Nitriding at 430 to 450 yields 860 because hardness, HP, surface hardness uh, to be precise, because the core hardness remains uh, as after aging. Only the surface hardness is what will vary, just to highlight that point. And the total case depth, the case depth is basically the depth wherein you have uh, this change of hardness, surface hardness. And that is uh, generally taken as the point where the hardness is roughly 50 Hb because hardness, the, the hardness is 50 Hb higher than the core hardness. So from that point up until the surface, you have case depth. So that's uh, the convention that is generally followed. So they were able to get this case depth of total case depth of 0.15 mm after 48 hours treatment. We know that nitriding is a prolonged heat treatment process. So it will be 40, minimum 40 hours to maybe going up to 72 hours. Even. So after about 48 hours of treatment, they were able to get this total case depth of 0.15 mm, which is typical of nitriding because you get about 0.25 max, uh, 0.25 mm maximum surface hardness uh, through nitriding generally. So they were able to get uh, hardness of 80, 860 uh, with that temperature and time shift. 450 degree nitriding uh, was found to produce some stable austenite in the nitrided zone, resulting in the decrease of hardness. As we discussed, austenite form. Uh, decreases the hardness. So this stable austenite was found to be produced in the nitrated zone that led to the decrease of hardness. For 480 degrees, about 800 Hp surface hardness, is at 0.25 mm after a uh, treatment time of 7 to 90 hours. So these are all uh, statistics from the research papers uh, for this conventional raising steel material. As for the corrosion resistance property, the corrosion rates are half as much as for low elastomers. So as was, as was highlighted earlier, that uh, although you are able to have corrosion rates, but they are less, they are half as much as for low elastomers. So that is one uh, remarkable feature, we can say, that they corrode half, uh, half the rate as the Low elastomers. They are susceptible to pitting corrosion in tap water and some neutral salt solutions as well. Uh, though average corrosion rates are lower in contrast to low elastomers. Again, the same thing that though it is susceptible to pitting corrosion in the said environments, but the average corrosion rates are lower uh, in contrast to low elastomers. In general, corrosion protection is advisable for the instance. That was uh, mentioned in the technical data books. That it is advisable to have corrosion protection being done, just as any other steel is protected from corrosion through these coatings. Uh, it is advisable that it be done for the raising steel as well. Uh, there is substantially greater resistance to oxidation at 540 degrees centigrade than a 5% corrosion tool steel. So, in comparison to the tool, tool steel, because this is a tool steel alloy, we mentioned, this is a unique. Carbonometed tool steel alloy. So, a comparison with the tool steel alloy and having 5% chromium, that the resistance to oxidation at 540 degrees centigrade, which is the high temperature we're talking about, it was found to have greater resistance to oxidation uh, than this steel. Another uh, 
after there is a gap, we can say. The uh, susceptibility to stress corrosion cracking is, is there because, uh, as I said, high strength, uh, I mean, it's a double edged sword. A high strength translates to higher susceptibility to stress corrosion cracking. So, this is inevitable that uh, you have high strength and not have corrosion cracking. The corrosion cracking tendency increases as the high and this as the strength increases. So it's a double edged sword. It does have the susceptibility to high uh, this stress corrosion cracking uh, concept. I mean the stress corrosion cracking mechanism. Relatively high K1 SCC values than other high strength steels. So this K1 SCC values is something uh, is a parameter that is uh, measured when it comes to. Uh, this cracks and the crack propagation uh, concept. So it has high K1 SCC values than any other uh, than other high strength steels, and therefore the ability to withstand greater crack depths before crack propagation. So the crack depth that this can withstand before the crack propagates to uh, in, to failure, basically, that's high. The ability to withstand greater crack depth is there in the resistance steels before it propagates to uh, failure. Uh, hydrogen embedded. This is susceptible to hydrogen embedded, uh, but it is less so than other high strength states. So again, another uh, thing to consider. And the hydrogen embedded uh, depends on the level of hydrogen that is absorbed during corrosion, pickling, Plating, even for lubricants used uh, during machining or hot working, etc. Heat treatment atmospheres also, or welding also. So these are all atmospheres wherein, or stages wherein the material is able to absorb hydrogen. These are all hydrogen absorbing points. So the hydrogen embrittlement is because of hydrogen absorbed from all these stages. Corrosion, pickling, plating. Lubricants, heat treatment atmospheres, welding, even. Uh, and uh, non stainless marine seals have moderate corrosion resistance and are resistant to stress corrosion packing and hydrogen embedding. So, non stainless marine seal, because of this carbon emission advantage, they have moderate corro corrosion resistance and uh, they are resistant to stress corrosion packing and hydrogen embedding. This carbon emission advantage. Uh, has this uh, has its steps or its uh, footprint even in the uh, corrosion tracking rail, the stress corrosion tracking rail, and hydrogen embrittlement uh, rail with respect to. So that uh, carbon emission advantage has its uh, effect and it plays a crucial role in these uh, aspects as well. Managing steel cracks propagate 10 times slower than other comparable steels. This was uh, taken from the technical data book that the cracks of this particular steel they propagate 10 times lower than compared to other comparable steels. So, another thing for even especially for impact applications that the crack is not able to propagate as with as much rate as it does for the other steels. So, that's 10 times lower, significant number. Corrosion tracking can be enhanced by cadmium plating or phosphate. So these are all those two methods are employed to enhance the corrosion tracking uh, or to basically avoid the corrosion tracking tendency. Uh, and another thing to note is the austenite affects the toughness issue, and it also affects the magnetic properties and stress corrosion tracking resistance also. So, Austin it also has an effect on the toughness achieved. So, this can be harnessed for uh, specific purposes. Wherein you have to have this uh, combined contribution of strength and toughness. So, this is where uh, we can say that uh, the, the material is able to strike the balance of high strength and good toughness. So, we can harness all these factors to impart uh, needed strength and needed toughness. So all these are factors that we can play with in order to have 
uh, material for specific application. So that's what uh, we can do with the different aspects, the different heat treatment aspect, the machining aspect, the manufacturing aspect, uh, night riding, etc. to be able to impart uh, specific properties uh, from the application as well. Hydrogen embrittlement, this can be, uh, we can recover the properties lost to baking treatments. The breaking treatments, uh, which are recommended are 150 to 300 degrees centigrade for 24 hours. Uh, we are able to recover those lost properties uh, because of this hydrogen embrittlement. So baking treatments are they, they come out as a solution to recover the lost properties. And conventional cathodic protection is not recommended because it has this danger of hydrogen embrittlement. And uh, which is what we discussed is not desirable. So, traditional cathodic production is uh, not recommended in practice for this material. And uh, a very uh, trending topic here additive manufacturing. Uh, this steel has been processed to additive manufacturing also. Uh, from about 2011, we have papers that have uh, taken into account this material. And, researched it from various uh, process parameters coming 3D printing. So we do have a significant uh, chunk of papers devoted to marine states. Uh, the reason why uh, there's a lot of papers on additive manufacturing in marine states is because the first point that we can reduce, include, safely include from the uh, traditional fabrication is that it is it involves complex processing and it is relatively uneconomic because it involves double or triple printing, you have forging to be done, rolling, machining, welding processes, complex geometries, because you can't uh, put uh, I mean, produce it in one go. You have to have this welding being done for different components once they are uh, machined, for example. So, double or triple melting, forging, rolling, machining, welding processes, several thermal frequencies, well, which are required for conventional fabrication of this material, have led to research, more research. It has uh, spurred research on, in additive manufacturing landscape. And uh, we can see, I mean, I, I'll support this with statistic that this is the third most processed laser powder bed fusion steel. In additive manufacturing, basically, we have this fabrication of uh, complex uh, components from 3D model data. Additive manufacturing or 3D printing generally, which is, it is referred to as 3D printing, you have fabrication of geometrically complex near net shape components directly from 3D model data to layer by layer deposition. That's a uh, Concise, compact uh, way to see additive manufacturing or 3D printing. We have layer by layer deposition. That's a key element to know. So, that layer by layer deposition, once it is done, you are able to have this product uh, and essentially no uh, post processing or negligible post processing. I mean, as compared to the conventional fabrication rule, the post-processing involved after 3D printing is very less, we can say. So, because of, uh, and so, additive manufacturing, it has generally two uh, technologies when it comes to metal additive manufacturing or metal 3D printing. You have laser powder bed fusion, you have uh, laser powder bed fusion, and uh, there is a big area additive manufacturing. Wire arc additive manufacturing, VAM, is also there. And uh, there's one more LDED, yes. Laser direct energy deposition. So, LDED, LPBM, these are two prominent uh, technologies under metal additive manufacturing. So, uh, in those two, 
you have one beam laser powder bed fusion, and in the laser powder bed fusion uh, processed steels, managing steel stands as the third most processed steel. So, and this is after SS stainless steel 316L and 304, the first and second position. So, that indicates the uh, advantages it has or the applications it has. And that's why uh, the industry is interested in the RNA manufacturing of managing steel. So, that's uh, one thing to note. And another thing is from, from the RNA manufacturing itself, we can say that uh, this is a high precision method of fabricating materials because we are able to form near net shape components. So it's high precision, it has maximized material savings. We are only printing material where we need it instead of uh, removing the material as we do in conventional fabrication. We are only putting the material where it is needed. Either you are printing it or you are solidifying I mean, there are different technologies, fuse deposition modeling, you have stereo lithography, uh, you have other uh, miscellaneous methods such as uh, there is uh, laminated object manufacturing long. So all these methods are there. And the metal 3D printing, you have, uh, as mentioned, laser powder bed fusion and direct energy deposition, both are employing laser. So, the point is, we are able to only, I mean, we are only solidifying the material or putting the material where it is needed. So there is maximized material savings, shortens the lead times because we don't have much uh, uh, processes going on. It's a one step process. This is a near instant uh, part production that we do. Near instant part production. So it, it, it avoids all those uh, different processes, as we mentioned, forging, rolling, machining, welding. Etc. These are just a few of the major processes that we do in conventional fabrication. So we are able to avoid those processes. This is a one-shot production, essentially. So that saves us a lot of time, processing time. So the lead times are shorter. And not just these processes, the, the, the fact that the material has to go to different places involving logistics, I mean, this involves logistics, and the R&D that goes in, the tools that are required, the R&D for the tool and uh, the several uh, fixtures, etc. All these are avoided when we are using one single machine that is dedicated to print uh, materials or melt materials. So you have shortened lead times. That's the point. Uh, and there is environmental friendliness also. And this is one of the reasons why this is promoted a lot. It helps achieving the sustainable developing goals. It has lesser carbon footprint, and that's where we are able to uh, harness more uh, components out of this technology without having much impact on the environment. It is environmental friendly as well, 3D printing technology. So, this is extensively researched. There are other grades. I'm sorry, 18 nickel 300 or M300 grade is extensively researched than when compared to the other grades, such as 18 nickel 250. The following reasons it has good printability, it has rapid solidification, and it resists crack. This is one useful or a key uh, feature to note that because it has less carbon, it cracks less as compared to the other states. So, and 3D printing or additive manufacturing, metal additive manufacturing to laser is essentially micro welding. You are welding powder particles, basically, through laser energy, uh, you know, through uh, this laser energy that you are directing at the powder, you are essentially welding the different powder particles together of micron size. So, that ability to solidify without cracking. Uh, gives this material more opportunity to uh, excel and uh, give out give good, good components, uh, uh, essentially defect free components because it doesn't crack, it solidifies rapidly, good printability has been noted. So, those uh, things are there, and then it is processed through all these techniques 
I mentioned LBTF, WAM, viral canadian manufacturing, LED techniques, and there's one specific paper which I mentioned in the references, uh, which has extensively and comprehensively uh, seen the different technologies and the papers that have come, which basically are these three technologies. Uh, from these three, te three technologies, how the material has uh, performed and was able to, I mean, the researchers were able to uh, control these different input parameters from the three different perspectives the laser power, the scan speed, the build orientation, the layer thickness, name of you. And they were able to optimize the mechanical properties, the resulting mechanical properties. So, those uh, those have been done, and, and to be uh, honest, if this additive manufacturing of managing steels uh, requires a separate video in itself, uh, as as I mentioned from 2011, there have there is a lot of plenty of papers, not uh, uh, unexpectedly because uh, third most process steel for a reason, so it requires a, a separate discussion in itself. I need to make another video. So the processing parameters, AM processing parameters, heat treatment influence is also been explored. So these two are majorly explored. The influence of heat treatment, what happens with different heat treatment time and temperatures, along with other factors, the combined effects also, the coupling effects of AM processing parameters, for example, build orientation, along with heat treatment schedule. Uh, how does this reflect on the mechanical problems? And mechanical properties generally, specifically, uh, you have, we have uh, uh, tensile properties, you have compressive uh, properties being explored, and uh, surface roughness, uh, residual stresses, etc. I mean, in terms of the machining, etc. So, coupling effects, Co the coupling effects of processing parameters from the additive manufacturing, the heat treatment, the different mechanical post processing, for example, machining, these are all. Uh, simultaneously change to, to see the effect of the final properties uh, or the uh, surface of the residual stresses as, as needed for uh, different applications. The defects structure and mechanical properties are studied as I mentioned. Even the defects because of the porosity and the, the microstructures because of the, because of the different uh, processing parameters the scanning strategies. So a lot of research has been done. The latest research review papers highlight that the majority of studies focus on tensile hardness and fatigue performance. But there is very limited research on impact hardness and corrosion resistance. And they highlighted that this, these studies are needed because we need steels, we need the steel to have corrosion resistance as well, impact hardness as well. And, uh, from what has been observed is a lot of papers have focused on the material from the tool and die application perspective. Atypical 300 is a tool and die material as, as I mentioned, tool, tool steel a lot. So a lot of papers have discussed and focused on the property enhancement from the tool and die application perspective. Uh, solution treatment before aging, uh, SAT. There are different heat treatment uh, schedules also explored. Not just the time and temperatures in the heat treatment. The different uh, routes, for example, solution treatment performed and then aging treatment performed. How does this uh, reflect on the properties? And they, so they found that the solution treatment before aging treatment, this helps to ensure complete transformation from austenite to metal side, as was the case with conventional fabrication. That solution treatment when done, it homogenizes the material. Therefore, we are having good performance, not normal performance uh, when it was aged later on. In direct aging, although it, it was able to achieve comparable strength, it lacks in toughness than SAD components. So, again, same point. If you want to maximize toughness, ensure that solution treatment is done. But if it is not uh, of priority, then Direct aging is also a factor. I mean, is also a, 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 a route that can be taken uh, if you want to have just strength and 
not focus and, and not have to focus much on the toughness aspect. So depending on application, uh, but the papers have highlighted the different properties, resulting properties uh, from the different groups, the treatment groups. So uh, as mentioned, ironical lab martin side, and this is soft and tough, and therefore it resists packing. That's what makes it more uh, attractive to researchers uh, to research more on this material. Uh, and apparently, I, I chose this material because it has good uh, uh, printability, as mentioned, and uh, has more uh, uh, prospects for the two day industry. Outstanding aging or hardening response, like other precipitation hardening systems, both in conventional and additive manufacturing. For example, a case study where within three minutes, the material was able to gain hardness from 28 to 43. So within three minutes. So this is an outstanding agent performance that we get. The hardening response is very swift. And therefore, the hardness increment as evident. Uh, and then after that, from 20 to 23 in three minutes, and then after that, to 52 in three hours. So after that, it is not that uh, drastic. It is gradual increase of hardness. But the point to note is the aging response is swift. It it, uh, uh, it it performs well or quick in aging response. And uh, what has been studied so far? Precipitate formation has been studied uh, in terms of what kind of precipitates and how the precipitates are forming, the evolution of precipitates, uh, the microstructure evolution even. So. And the version of oxygen. This is uh, this has been studied so far uh, that you don't need much oxygenite reversion because this leads to loss of properties. Uh, and of course, the dimensional stability perspective is to discuss. So those are uh, some of the concept concepts that have been studied so far. And uh, coming to the challenges and innovations uh, for this material. Uh, this is uh, more in uh, relation to the conventional fabrication that this the premium cost of the steel over other tool steels uh, with less nickel. I mean, those other tool steels which are having less nickel, uh, this uh, uh, cost aspect has prevented Parisian steels from taking over a large segment of the tool and bone making device, especially for the tool and industry. Uh, this has come off as an inherent limitation. The cost, the premier cost of the steel, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the addition of different alloying elements, the costly alloying elements, makes the material expensive. And therefore, uh, that came off as a barrier to have this, uh, I mean, to, to accept for the material engineers of the industries to accept this material. This has become a barrier, the cost aspect. Uh, because we mentioned that there is 30% share of alloy elements, major share, and these are very expensive alloys. So, so that, and we can say that this is suitable for applications where cost is not major or primary concern. If the primary concern is cost, then managing steel is not the material to, uh, it's not a good alternative or a feasible alternative, or an economic alternative. So we can safely say that this is suitable for applications where cost is not a major or primary concern. But if industry is, for example, aerospace industry, where you need more of uh, property, uh, this is uh, an industry which, require, which focuses more on properties, which prioritizes properties, prioritizes performance over cost. The material turns out to be an attractive alternative as mentioned earlier. So, so only for those industries, critical industries, it becomes a powerful alternative, we can say. Uh, but another thing to note is uh, I mentioned the cost offset concept that at the point wherein you are investing, I mean, you are investing. So the lower tool steel alloys also in terms of 
the delays and expenses involved therein after the material, for example, fails and has to be repaired, and the performance that you get out of it, the durability aspect. So the alternative could be, do you want an expensive 20 step detailment process? For example, this is for a wing hinge of a fighter plane. And there were several parts that were made and it was welded. It involved an expensive twin step key treatment process. Uh, and the material was conventional uh, low steel alloy. So do you want to take a low steel alloy and uh, employ this expensive 20 step key treatment process? So you are investing somewhere or the other. So that is uh, something to consider when it comes to finalizing what material to uh, finalize. Uh, this is something that we, uh, that uh, the material engineers can look into in terms of the properties that this material is able to offer. But again, the cost investment point is where uh, the decision may have this influence. So that uh, is there. And uh, when applied as a cladded layer, the required volume of magnetite is much lower. So this makes the higher cost easier to justify in view of the input performance. So when it, it is applied as a cladded layer, there's not much material required. The required volume of the resin steel is much lower. And therefore, you can justify the higher costs because it gives improved performance. Cobalt-free managing steels have developed. I mean, in the efforts towards bringing down the material or production costs, uh, they, they saw that because cobalt is strategic resource, strategic cobalt resource, uh, made uh, the material engineers to look uh, at the material, uh, to, to look into this omission of cobalt. How do we omit this cobalt so that we are able to even uh, preserve this resource for other needed applications while also reducing the cost of the material. So that is something uh, that was done. Cobalt free materials were developed. And uh, the, they were able to achieve strength levels of up to 2,000 megapascals. So this is a significant achievement. But even without the uh, cobalt addition, the maraging steels that were developed, the cobalt-free maraging steels, were able to achieve strength levels of up to 2,000 megapascals. And there are, there are some efforts on even manganese substituted maraging steel also in, the, in place of nickel. So these are all efforts towards uh, bringing down the material and production costs even. 3D printed tooling inserts with conformal tooling channels have been developed for die, die casting tooling applications. In additive manufacturing papers, we see these conformal tooling channels. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the mention of conformal tooling channels because these inserts, when these inserts were employed in the die, in the die they require they they require to cool down fast because the amount of components being produced on the die uh, this is dependent on how fast you are able to cool the components of the die and this involves the cooling itself as well so the amount or, or the time to cool down uh, has influence on the amount of components that you are able to produce so more productivity entails faster cooling rate of the tooling inside. And this is possible through conformal cooling channels. Uh, wherein you, ha you have these channels inside the tooling insert uh, with optimal geometries and optimal orientations and the uh, paths that have, to, that have been designed. This is able to uh, cool down the tooling insert much faster. And this is possible only through additive manufacturing. You cannot make conformal cooling channels, this complex, uh, intricate, complicated conformal cooling channels. Conventional fabrication is not possible. So 3D, 3D printing is now uh, being looked at for this conformal cooling channels uh, in the tooling inserts. So there are a lot of papers discussing this 3D printed tooling inserts with conformal cooling channels for uh, specifically the die casting cooling applications. As mentioned, the 3D nickel 300 material is a preferred choice for tool steels. So that is there. And there is even uh, paper, there are even papers on concurrent improvement of surface toughness and residual stress. Uh, and this was found to be possible with optimized 
finish and air filling process parameters besides the AM and AP parameters. So as mentioned, uh, concurrent uh, coupling effects, com coupling effects of additive manufacturing process parameters, the heat treatment parameters, and the mechanical post processing also in terms of milling that they were able to uh, change the cutting speed and the feed rate along with varying the heat treatment parameters and the additive manufacturing parameters to see how each one has an effect. This is kind of a multi-objective optimization. Wherein they saw how we can we uh, uh, control all these parameters at different uh, in, in, in the different aspects and get this uh, optimized surface surface and residual stress. So how do we concurrently improve both surface surface and residual stress? And uh, there are papers which have the references which have uh, dealt with this concurrent improvement of surface surface and residual stress for the raising states. Simultaneous nitriding and aging treatment was uh, feasible found feasible for conventional manufacturing for raising states only. With uh, additive manufacturing, they mentioned that this is not feasible uh, as this hinders when the precipitates are uh, hindering uh, the uh, nitride process. So, the nitride forms, the nitrides forms are competing with the precipitates form. Uh, so, that has this uh, limitation. Uh, this is simultaneous nitride and aging was found possible for. Are feasible for conventional raising streets and not additive manufactured uh, raising streets. Low temperature nitriding, i.e., 360 at 360 degrees centigrade before aging. Uh, I mean, there are two routes that we are explored. One is where you form nitriding before aging, and one is where you have form nitriding after aging. So before and after aging. So uh, what was mentioned, what was observed was these uh, nitrides where uh, if, if the nitriding is performed after aging, there's not much case that achieved. And the logical reason is because the precipitates form are not uh, maybe the precipitates have already taken. Uh, much of uh, what do you call the the surface is now uh, not amenable to nitride formation, nitride uh, nitrides formation. The nitride uh, the, the the nitrides that are formed uh, in the nitriding process, these are not available after aging. So the precipitates become a barrier to this infusion or diffusion of nitrogen in the material, and as a consequence, you have less. Uh, case hardness achieved. And therefore, the route that was explored uh, in, in, in the paper, prominent paper that, uh, that I'll mention the references, is that they nitrided, they, they, they performed low temperature nitriding. And then the, this low temperature nitriding was able to diffuse some of the nitrogen, although not much nitrogen, only a certain amount of nitrogen. And then the material was aged so that these nitrides were diffused more, and even the aging was able to uh, take place. So that's a, a very good concept that was uh, uh, seen, and this was able to impart both uh, core hardness. I mean, the core hardness was, was uh, increased, and even the surface hardness was. So this is something, uh, this is a good exploring uh, case uh, for case four property improvement uh, that, that was uh, recently uh, mentioned. I mean, this was recently published. So this route of low temperature nitrating before aging was found to increase nitrating depth, uh, both for conventional and 3D printing for aging states. I mean, there are papers even for conventional raising streets where they were able to achieve this uh, nitriding followed by aging group to be feasible for optimizing both the surface hardness and the surface hardness and the core hardness. And, uh, and there, there is even challenge from the 
precipitate fraction determination. What fraction of precipitates are formed has come out to be a challenge to determine this uh, fraction of precipitates uh, because the precipitates are very small, uh, small precipitate size and low volume, uh, low volume fraction of these precipitates uh, makes this uh, determination of this precipitate fraction difficult. So that is also because these precipitates are nano size precipitates, so very difficult to uh, catch even with the transmission and electron microscopy. Because transmission electron microscopy, they were able to uh, trace these uh, precipitates after prolonged aging, not after five hours or six hours of aging, after maybe ten hours of aging or twelve hours of aging. Is only after over aging the material do we uh, were they able to uh, trace these precipitates because they are nano size as I mentioned. Uh, so these are some of the challenges and the innovations accordingly that have come up uh, for this material, both from the commercial perspective and the additive manufacturing perspective. These are the some specifications uh, that we see in the additive manufacturing, so the aerospace industry. AMS 6512, AMS 6514. So they have the standard procedures, the precautions that need to be taken care of, both from the manufacturing, the manufacturing, the uh, heat treatment, the mechanical post processing, etc. So these are all specifications and uh, the references uh, that can be referred for more information. Uh, conventional additive manufacturing, I'm sorry, conventional amazing seals and additive manufacturing amazing seals. I have included both references. And uh, that, that's where I will go. So the uh, idea was to uh, give this comprehensive overview of the raising sales, mostly from the conventional perspective, the conventional fabrication perspective, and very briefly uh, in terms of the additive manufacturing realm. Uh, but I, I would say that additive manufacturing uh, it, it requires more discussion. And uh, there are a lot of papers, uh, a lot of concepts, uh, I mean, a lot of processing parameters that have been varied uh, to have these uh, effect on the properties or the, uh, the, the minimization of defects, etc. So, hopefully, this will uh, benefit those who are looking for uh, condensed uh, information regarding the raising students. Uh, and this may uh, accelerate more research uh, in the raising seals, especially from the recent additive manufacturing uh, landscape, and even some improvements in the conventional, uh, some more improvements, I would say, in the conventional fabrication. So uh, that's where I would end. Thank you for your time and attention.